Good afternoon and welcome to the SANA stream and our continuing series of streaming events brought to you by SANA Lake Recovery. I'm Scott Gardner and I'll be your host for today's event. Today, we're excited to welcome a former professional hockey player who spent 14 years playing in the NHL and Europe, including some of those years playing for his hometown, St. Louis Blues. Please welcome Eureka native and retired St. Louis player, Cam Jansen. What's up, Scotty? What's going on, buddy? Nothing much. Thanks, Cam. Welcome, and thank you for being here today. Of course. So I wanted to start by going back to your playing days. So, Cam, could you tell our audience watching today what it felt like to get to live out a childhood dream of playing hockey in front of your hometown of St. Louis? Well, you know, it didn't just happen, Scotty. And we've talked a million times over. But, you know, I grew up in, you know, my parents are from Brentwood, Missouri. They moved out to kind of like a way far out in the House Springs area. So I was kind of born out there. And we really moved out. We lived in the middle of the woods, but I had a big basement. And I played hockey in the basement. But the reason why I got into hockey is because my dad would take me. He'd take me everywhere, for one. But he'd take me to Cardinals games, and I'd walk around Bush Stadium and be like, oh, cool, what's going on? Oh, somebody hit the ball. I'm like, oh, this is cool. But then he took me to hockey games, and I went, and I sat by the glass, and, you know, Tony Twist went out there and pummeled somebody and then took his jersey off and went crazy in the penalty box, and everybody was going nuts, and then Kelly Chase did his thing. And then Brett Hall's out there scoring, sniping pucks, you know, three goals a game, breaking records, doing this, had a big – yellow mullet it was just so <laughs> entertaining and i got into that and i'm like i got obsessed with the blues and hockey and I, I just started skating in my basement and it just became that i played roller hockey and then started learn to skate and then kind of went boom 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 and then all of a sudden the trade happened and i started playing for the blues but it just you know it hockey wasn't a big deal in st louis at the time as far as youth hockey is concerned and um, I try to pave the way for everybody, and I was kind of the first one to do it, and um, and it was an unbelievable feeling. But it it didn't just happen, you know. Like there was a lot that went into it. Sure, and I think I remember you telling me once before that your dad really got you into hockey is because you and your brothers were just they he had to come up with something to take care of all the energy and all the fighting and all the roughhousing that you guys did, and thought that hockey was the best outlet for you guys to get a lot of that, that energy out. Well, we played every sport and we played uh, football to soccer, to baseball, to cross country, to wrestling, to track, wh wh whatever it is, we, we played it all. And hockey seemed to be the one sport, at least for me, that I could let my energy out and have a personality too. Right. Like yeah. whatever I did, like you could skate around and I could be the tough guy and I'm like, you know, do my thing where in football it's like, Go this way, hit that guy, and block that guy. And I'm like, okay, you're a robot. Or in hockey, you just kind of like, I could have swag, or I can grow my hair out. I could uh, tuck my jersey in. I could be that mean, you know, just whatever. You could look in the – I don't know. You just – you could you could uh, put your personality and your athleticism together in hockey, and you're in kind of free control mode when you're on the ice. And it just was appealing, and it was fun. And you could skate fast. And the hitting and the fighting, and I'm like, what? You could do everything in that sport. And I'm like, I'm, I became obsessed with it. Sure. And you're being real modest about, you know, paving the way because you really did pave a way for a lot of, you know, the players uh, growing up in St. Louis. You know, um, Pat Maroon, who you played with and is a buddy of yours, Clayton Keller, you know, some of these other guys that um, also grew up playing in St. Louis. So they saw you and saw that you could do it, you know, and that gave them incentive you know, to really push hard that, you know, even though St. Louis wasn't always known as a, a hockey hotbed, they've always had a lot of hockey here, but it just, you know, wasn't like it is in some of the Northern States and, and obviously in Canada, but you did pave the way. It, for is, now. it is now. Yeah, it is now. And, oh, yeah. yeah. You know, it's not just like doing it and figuring it out. You know, everything had to, had to fall into play, but I was doing my thing and I had to fight guys and, and learn how to get the puck off, off the wall and be able to skate hard to be able to hit guys consistently. But when I came into town, I'd always have the young kids come out and skate with us, even if I knew they were good or not. But if they were willing to work and I'd bring them in the locker room, we'd be funny with them and we'd teach them different things. They'd look up to all of us that we're already making money. And 
sitting in the show and they're watching us on TV and I was maybe playing for the Blues or the Devils even before I played for the Blues. Like we take all those kids out. If an agent in town would have a, 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 a big hockey tournament, he'd invite me. I'd take care of all the guys and bring them out and make them sure they had fun and work on things. And, you know, just, I don't know, d- d- tuck them under my wing a little bit, but in a fun way, not like, oh, do this, but just saw how I was able to do it. And they're like, oh my God, I want to, I want to be able to do what he does, walking into places, getting treated like gold. You know, I don't know. It just, but we didn't like be like, no, we're all in our own little group. No, we took those young kids, like, come in here, sit down. Here, what, what do you need? Like, let's go. When we take you out, like, what do you need to do? And I know it sounds kind of petty, but it's not. They loved it. And they were like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. God, he's living a life. Let's, this is awesome. I'm going to work harder now. Yeah, and, and I've been out of the rink with you in the past, and you always talk to the kids that are out there playing. You always make time oh, for yeah, them. Of course. You know, you don't uh, try to ignore them. You you try to give them tips. You know, you talk to them. Um, and I know they appreciate it because when I was a kid playing hockey, you know, and if I had that, you know, opportunity to be able to, to talk to a professional player, you know, that would have made all the difference. As Scotty, a kid growing up. if I went to the rink, so say we have that new Mills rink. Sorry, my kitty's right here. But if we have that new Mills, or not Mills rink, but the, the Centene rink, mm-hmm. you got all the Blues practice in there. You have all these young kids. You have all kinds of hockey tournaments and games and uh, the AAA kids that are dominating. And you walk through there as a young kid, and you see me walking around talking. Like if I, when I was young and I was able to see a pro athlete and they were nice to me and they talked to me like I wasn't some kid, but they talked to me like I, they knew me for a while or something. I, I mean, I'd be like this. Oh my god, I'm obsessed with you. Like you're normal. Wow, you talk to me like a normal person. I we do that. There's we have a, our own alumni room there. There's kids everywhere. I go to little girls, uh, the lady cyclones practice, and I'll bang on the glass. And they'll be like, oh yeah. Then they'll go out there and like rock some of these. They play against boys, and they'll go there and hit, kick, like own them and like rough them up and play. I go to the net and score a goal and wave to me, and it's just the coolest thing in the world to see all these kids and you have all these ex NHL guys and blues and this, that, and the other there. It's a fantasy land. And it just, it just it multiplies kids that want to get engaged with the sport. That's awesome. So, you know, in your post hockey afterlife, you made a really nice transition into radio and television broadcasting. You know, Cam can be heard daily on his radio show, the Camp Jansen show on 590 of the fan. And he also, name, has a, he also <laughs> has a wildly successful podcast, Cam and Strick, which is ranked in the top three podcasts in the U.S. and Canada. And you guys have some great people on there. I mean, you didn't even start at the bottom. I mean, when you can get the great one, Wayne Gretzky, on your show, I mean, where do you go from there? I mean, well, we got we got him on our 99th episode, too. So, that like, <laughs> yeah, that's that awesome. you know, like. Well, like Andy has a lot of contacts and I'm respected in the game and, you know, I'm funny and I I was always good to everybody. So if they know I'm fair and, you know, I'm a little bit edgy when it comes to things because I'm, I'm real and try to be myself as much as possible and that's relatable and people like that. And so Wayne, like, doesn't just go on play like podcast, Scotty. So when he comes on, he's like, no, these guys know what they're doing. They do their homework. They're going to be have fun with me. And I don't have to do this, but I respect both of them, and I will. And 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 a lot of times, these GMs are somebody that got fired want to come on and tell their story that maybe was uh, ridiculed in a different kind of way in a big media market. So they want to let it out, and they know that we have a big fan base of where people could hear their side of things for once, right? So like, it's all kinds of, kinds of different variables where you get these guys on. But the bottom line is, they respect Andy and I. If they didn't yeah. respect us, well, they wouldn't come on. We wouldn't yeah, get absolutely. Wayne Gretzky for he, he'd be like, well, I don't have time for that. So we just have a good system going where we balance being edgy, being very knowledgeable, telling, being heartfelt, talking about day to day things before the interview starts. And then once you get into the interview, like just be real with guys. Like we're talking, like, what's up, Scott? You're like, what are you? So what are you down on? You cooking? And I, and then you, you start off slow and then you dig into things that maybe are touchy, but they know that. People want to know about it, and you're going on a podcast for a reason. Yeah, and absolutely. I always call you guys, you you and Andy are the Howard Stern of the hockey podcast because it's always entertaining. 
There's always a lot of stuff going on, but it's great. But he's I making a hundred million dollars a year, Scotty. Okay, he's making a hundred million dollars a year. I wish we well, were. <laughs> well, you're not making his money, but you're doing yeah. something similar in, in yeah, your style. I, yeah, I get your money, you know. Right, but you're also. Uh, I want to mention that you also um, are doing television commentary analysis for KSDK Channel Five during the St. Louis Blues hockey season. So you've got a, a pretty full plate. And I also want to mention um, that you also are heavily involved in charitable work in the St. Louis area. You've worked with the Backstoppers and Guns and Hoses, and you and I have worked uh, with the Shriners over the last few years, oh, Shriners yeah. Hospital for Children for oh. their, their Christmas toy drive. My and uh, who else have you worked with? Oh, my God. Pujols Foundation, which we love. And Albert came around the other day. Albert Pujols is such a cool cat, and I love his foundation. Yeah, the, the kids and the, the, the girls and boys that are part of that are the sweetest. And I they're always in the golf tournaments. They're huge hockey fans, huge baseball fans. When we go to Shriner, Scotty, and we walk in, and sometimes it might be a kid that knows who you are. And you could be like, hey, what's up? But sometimes it's a young girl that's just going through a tough time. And she's like, the last part, the last thing she wants to do is see, uh, you know, she's – you're not doing good. She's not feeling right. And I don't know. We just try to make them smile. And I, I love Shriners. I love walking around and, you know, they might be embarrassed at the beginning. Cause they're like, God, where am I? You know, you know how it is. Mm -hmm. And then you walk in and you talk to them. And then at the end they're happy. And you're like, God, that's all I wanted. I just want to see you happy. I want to, you know, it's, it's so sad. It makes you want to cry. But I, some of these, uh, these places, man, we, we do a, we do a great job. The blues alumni do a great job too, by the way. They do. Anytime they need us to do something, kids with cancer, first responders, military, I mean, what, whatever it is, we're there for them. We raise money when, when we need to. We just raise money the other day. You know, Jamie Rivers had to go up there and get roasted for five hours, Scotty, but <laughs> raise money for all kinds of different stuff. But that's what you do. That's yeah, what you Jamie need. deserves it, though. He deserves it. I wimped out on it, but I, I entertain my own way. You know, you get drafted. People pay money to skate with you anyway. But we do so many different events. Responder Rescue, another one that doesn't get a lot of attention, that should get a lot of attention. It's endless. And um, and uh, just to see, but the, the bottom line is my favorite, though, Scotty, you know, when you go into Shriners and see those kids at Christmas time and we're just handing out toys left and right and they finally could, like, feel good for a little bit, you know? Yeah. So oh, yeah. I, I, know. I love it. And it's funny, though, that when you said that, they may not know you. Some of those people definitely know you because I saw them come up with – posters that you didn't even recognize from your playing day. Oh, yeah. And asked you to sign them. You're like, where'd you get this from? And you're like, I know. And they're like, oh, I got this. You're like, you didn't even know it existed or forgot, you know. Yeah, but, but then there's, a, then there's a girl from Kentucky, though, Scotty. Then that's a girl from Kentucky that didn't have a, a great uh, hospital there. Like Shriners is unbelievable. So they had to come up here that maybe aren't Blues fans. Then you walk in there and they talk to you. Then they look you up and they become a hockey fan and they just were happy. You know, it's it's not an easy thing to do sometimes, but I I feel like I have a gift where I could do that kind of stuff, where I could walk into a room and kind of feel it out and be like, well, you know, I, I don't know. I, I love doing that stuff. It's one of my – it just makes you feel good when yeah, at the end it does. It makes you feel good. You do a great job. So I'm going to change gears here if you don't mind. Um, good, man. So you worked long and you worked hard to get to the professional level. You've achieved success as a pro and you've also made that transition – uh, as a successful career after hockey, and you continue to give back to the community with your involvement in charities. But, you know, life wasn't always that easy for you. You know, you also battled at times with substance use during your playing career. Cool. So, you know, we want to talk about that for a few minutes, if we could. What substances did you struggle with to start with? Well, how much time you got? No, I'm just joking. Uh, no, I look, let me let me say this first. I busted my butt to get where I was. I had to fight guys. I had to do everything. I came out of nothing. My parents and my mommy and dad didn't have a lot of money. They didn't know the hockey world. I did I, I did it the hard way, and I stuck by it the hard way. Fine. Everything I'm going to tell you right now is self-induced, just so you know. It's all me, and that's fine. It, but I just don't want people to don't feel sorry for me by any means. And my mom and dad were awesome, so they didn't – I wasn't malnourished because of them. So just, just so you guys know. Now, I had to bust my butt and figure it out one way or the other. But this is all self-induced. But it was hardcore, Scotty. Like, I I dabbled in things because I was a party guy. You know, like, you're at a party. Like, I became popular at a young age where just you go in places where 
you know, you're the big boy in Windsor and you're going to a party in Windsor, Ontario, where you just fought three guys in front of 6,000 people and you, you know, you're partying, everybody knows who you are and you're dabbling with stuff. Like the, the, you get caught up in stuff like that. But the painkiller abuse got me and, and, and took away my soul for a bit. And I know it's hardcore, but I got to, I kind of got to be that. It, it took away my soul. I, that was I, I drank, I did everything, but that I couldn't control at all. I can control my booze, the, every other stuff, fine. This thing took me and took control of my body. And I got hurt when I was young, and I got you know 190 of these 20 milligram Percocets. And I was making you know six hundred thousand dollars, and I was 21 years old, and I was out for six months, and I had no obligations for anything because I was hurt, and I'd sit there. And eat these damn things and they controlled my life and then i had to live a fake life because i i act like i wasn't on them and then i mean there's so much to it but i went through hell and back and it was my fault and i had to deal with my way but it cost me a lot of money i put a ton of pressure on my family I done near killed myself a couple times and we don't even get into that, which kind of did. It was, it was hardcore. My mom and dad had to go through hell with me, but I got through it yep. and I never fucking think about them ever again. So where, uh, what, what point were you at when you realized that you needed that help? Where were you? Oh, geez. Well, you know, well, was there a defining moment yeah. or was I'm it sitting, just- I think it was, it was probably three or four weeks into my initial big Percocet injury where I had nothing to do. Scott, I had uh, a big house in Jersey. I'm 21 years old. I had video games out the wazoo. I had nothing but time on my hands. Cause I'm like, this. Yeah, so I just get surgery done. I don't need to be at the rink. The guys are going on doing playing their games, and I'm young, and I had money, and I had a bunch of painkillers, and I just started taking them, and I then I all of a sudden I didn't know how to function without them. Now I'm like, oh, I felt weak, so I got off of them, and all of a sudden I start sweating. I'm like, oh, like what is this? Like you're withdrawing. I'm like, oh, I don't want to get that again. Now you're finding it off the black market, and you're like now you're paying money for it, or you're going to the doctor and getting that refill that you don't need. You don't need it. Maybe you got, but but you you want it because you're not used to sitting even on the couch without doing them. So um, that it didn't take long to get you. And I have an addictive personality anyway, so it just it just it's like the devil like grabs me like no, we control you now. And you try to have a girlfriend on that, you know, like everything goes not good. You think you're a superhero on the ice, like a bad, and all of a sudden you can't even like function right, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, when you talk about that, um, then you made that decision. I guess you reached out to uh, Midwest Institute of Addiction um, for help, who, who coincidentally is a part of Sauna Lake's continuum of care now. Yeah. Um, so how did that go? Oh, well, it's in dire needs of something. I, I, I was... You know, when you buy it off the black market, too, not to mention it's, it's expensive as all hell. Like, you're dealing with this shady stuff, right? Like, you know, and have my buddies drive down the city and drop off whatever. Like, I can have people. And not to mention, like, I'm not just some dude from Franklin County. Like, I had, I, I, I could I can get away with having people do things for me, right? Which is, you think it's cool? It's not. Like, you're taking advantage of people because your addiction. Like, I could have somebody drop off stuff in my house at 3 o'clock in the morning on Christmas Eve if I wanted to. Right in my mailbox. Like, go ahead. You know, do people do you think favors, you know? Um, so I took advantage of that too. Um, mm-hmm. So it just, God, it just grabbed me and I, I couldn't get out of it. And I was just, my girlfriend at the time, oh, like you couldn't, you know, you're just, that, that's, all, that's all you're thinking about. My poor parents back and forth. But then I, I overdosed a couple times and I met Kate, my lovely wife now. And she's like, we have to do something about it. So I had to call him up. And I was so able, I was so able to hide things. I'm such a functioning addict when it comes to that. Where I could just walk, I could walk, I could take, and I walk into a room like hi, and just be funny and cool. And that's a scam. I could be that sober. I could be that messed up on whatever. I could, I could hide it from you. And it's, it's a good thing and it's a bad thing. It's a bad thing because if I wasn't able to do that, I would have been sober a long time ago. You know. Right. And, and that was probably one of the hardest things you ever had to do in your life was to make that decision 
to reach out and actually get help. You know, people oh, talk yeah. about it and think about it, but uh, the reality of it is when you're suffering from addiction, the majority of the people out there do not reach out for help or for treatment, but you found, you know, the strength to do that. I tried to go cold turkey, time. Scotty. I couldn't, I did, I did cold turkey a couple of times, which is so horrible. And then I had to go to training camp and like fight and hide it and stuff like that. But, but then I'm like, I, I need help. And so they got me into therapy and then I got on Suboxone. Now Suboxone is another drug that you have to take as, you know, you can't abuse because it's, it's, it, it cuts off your craving for everything, which saved me. But then you have to get off that stuff too, eventually. And when I was at the time, Scott, when I'm fighting these guys, I'm still in the minors. I'm going up and down in the minors. Like I'm, later in my career, I finally got on Suboxone, which saved my life initially. It really did. But getting off of that was very difficult as well. And I am still had to like be the crazy guy that I am. And it makes you dull, right? Mm -hmm. It just makes you like blah. And I can't be blah. I'm fighting guys, Scotty. Like I'm hitting. I have to be that. I'm the protector, right? I have to be the funny guy in the locker room. And I was just... It made you blah, like, you know, like, yeah. And I, I didn't like that, but it made me not crave that opioid. And I honestly, then I finally got off the box. And, and I honestly, to all you guys listening, I'm sorry, I'm going on a rant, but pff, I got my, I got my master's in this stuff, guys. If I didn't have Suboxone, I, and I got off of that, I don't even think about painkillers. Even if I get injured, I don't even think about them. They used to be the only thing on my mind. I don't even think about it. well that's awesome so what does having a facility like sauna lake do you think means for people who are struggling now with substance use well you want to save your life you have to look you got to do it for yourself well my kids are getting on look my wife no no you gotta do it for yourself when I when I overdosed a couple of times and I got up and I'm just like, oh my God. And I'm just like, I'm seeing everything fade away from me. And I'm like, what am I doing? I'm weak. I'm yellow. I'm like, I have, I'm the man. Like I'm beating guys up. Like I'm the man. Like I could, I own this, this is my town. Like what, you know, like I'm the, oh, my buddies look up to me. My wife looks like my, my mom and dad cherish. They watch everything I've ever done. They just like, I'm the man. And this, this little damn thing owns me. What? No, like I, I, I can't. I can't. It's not just my wife. It's not just my parents. It's not my poor little animals. Anything. Like it's. I gotta do it. You be your man again. And I finally it came to senses. And I'm like, no, I'm doing it for myself. And I had to get off the box. And I knew it was gonna be a long journey. And I sucked it up. I sucked it up. And I finally got off of that. And I was free. And I'm like, whew. And I feel great now. I really do. I mean, I get problems. I still, I still got problems, Scotty. Like, don't get me wrong, but they're not painkiller problems. It's not that demon controlling every bit of my life. Yeah, absolutely. And recently, you had on your one of your podcasts. You had uh, Robin Leonard. And for the people who don't know who Robin Leonard is, he's a professional hockey player um, who plays for the Las Vegas Golden Knights. He's one of the top goaltenders in the league. And he's been very open and very honest about his experience and his um, issues with substance use and also with mental health. And he's been a huge advocate for that. So I wanted to ask you how, um, you know, is that normal for, especially for a athlete who's, you know, playing now instead of being retired, is that normal for them to be willing to come out in public and talk about, you know, uh, substance use and behavioral health um, as a as a professional athlete. I'm assuming that's probably not that common. No, it's not. But I think it should be somewhat common. Now, he takes it to an extreme. He has problems, but he is very, very open, meaning he'll bash his own organization. And you're like, OK, now just to be able to talk about your addiction and getting through it and be able to be open with the press and kind of tying that into your play and how to do whatever. Like I, 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 I like that. It's healthy and it's open. He's a little wild when it comes to telling stories about past organizations and what they did and stuff. He's just an open book one way or the other. Now is that, I love it as a, as a, if I'm an organization, would I want a guy 
that open about stuff, no. But if your your internal mental health stuff, yeah, talk about it. P tell people that it's okay. Like tell people that you could be a professional athlete and still have mental health and get through it and be able to be successful. I'm looking on the scale of <laughs> bashing other teams. Scotty Ray heard him on our podcast. Like he'll talk about teams before that. But as far as the mental health and the addiction stuff, tell people that. People, I'm telling you, man, when I talk about my past with painkiller abuse and things like that, I get so many DMs. I leave all my DMs open. They talk to me, boom, tell me about different things, this, that, and the other. I reach, they reach out to me more about that than talking to Wayne Gretzky about a big comment he had, or a, you know, Robin Leonard said something about this. It's all about you know, them relating to you and knowing that if you can get through it, going through all that stress, anybody can. So that I think Robin's doing a great job. Um, but he's out there, man. And he's certainly an open book, but it's great to get him on a podcast. Lee Scotty. Well, that's what I'm going to recommend everyone go yeah. to Cam's and Strix podcast because you have a lot of great guests. Um, you have some, um, some interesting well, we Robin is a, is a great uh, interview. Oh. Um, Eddie Bell for the Eagle, who a lot of blues fan knows, who he is. He's a great interview and really entertaining. Um, a lot of players are really entertaining. And, um, you know, once again, I want to thank you for sharing your story with us today, because I think that's really impactful. I think that uh, you brought to light a lot of things that people may not realize, especially on the professional athlete side that, you know, people do struggle. Um, it doesn't matter. It doesn't discriminate with mental health and with substance use doesn't matter who you are. It can afflict everyone. Yep. As you can attest to that. So I really want to thank you for coming on today. And once again, I want to tell everybody that Cam can be heard daily on the 590 of the fan and on his highly ranked uh, entertaining podcast. As I said, Cam and Strick, go check that out. You will not, um, you will love it. I, I'm telling you, if you're, a, even if you're not a hockey fan or you're a sports fan or, or a casual fan, you'll enjoy um, what these guys have to say. And also look for Camp doing commentary analysis during the Blues hockey season. He's on KSDK Channel 5. Cam, I want to thank you for being here with us today. It was great seeing you again. Until Anytime. next time, everyone have a great day.